hello everyone um we're back for our second video and um, we had so many lovely questions we couldn't bear not to answer them um so we decided to do a second one sooner um than we planned after we finished the first video and had a little chat um we will do a little overview again if in case you are just watching the second video um and then we'll talk a little bit more about tips on how to develop um, oral motor skills. We talked a lot about in the last video about red flags that we thought sounded like there were some delays in the oral motor skills, which are all the things happening inside your child's mouth that they need to have working in order to eat. Um, so we'll give you some tips on um, how you can start helping them develop those. Um, but first we'll just do a little kind of overview. So people watching this video. Um, if you didn't watch the first one, you know what we're talking about. <laughs> um, so yeah, so welcome and thank you very much for joining us. I um, hope you enjoy the video and find it helpful. Um, we got tons of really great questions that are all really relevant. Um, so thank you very much for sharing your stories with us. Um, obviously, we don't have enough information to give medical advice on even though you did give us nice information. Um, because feeding is so incredibly complex, it's the most complex thing that a child does in their day. Um, we do um, need to do a multidisciplinary assessment with lots of different professionals to make sure there aren't any underlying medical issues, to look at the children's sensory issues, to look whether there's any developmental delays or um, oral motor or uh, motor skill delays. We wanna look to check whether there's any swallow issues going on. Um, look at any postural issues that the child has um, and all these kind of underlying difficulties can result in delayed feeding skills. Um, psychosocial um, distress, kind of social disruption to meal times um, and can affect a child's nutrition. So, so certainly it's a very complex problem when a child doesn't want to eat. Um, and so, yeah, so we would always recommend that you have a full assessment. Um, that being said, we'll do our best to give some general educational advice, and that's what this advice should be taken as, um, our general goodwill and just, um, yeah, just educational advice and not medical advice, basically. Um, we are both SOS feeding therapists, um, which is a, um, approach from America that's 30 years of experience. It's a highly evidence-based feeding program um, and it's just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant result for children. So I highly recommend you guys looking into the SOS approach to feeding um, and coming to us if you're interested in looking for an SOS feeding team. So um, I'm Louisa. I'm a children's occupational therapist. I'm also uh, sensory integration advanced practitioner. So I work with, ch with children with sensory needs, which more often than not overlap with the feeding needs. Um, and um, I'll let Sarah introduce herself, who is joining us again today. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Louisa. I'm Sarah Jones. I'm a speech and language therapist of 27 years. I, for the last 15 years, have specialised in dysphagia which is eating drinking and swallowing and uh, have worked across a variety of different sectors I have worked a lot in hospitals so seem very acute but at the moment I'm working with children who are in hospital but also when they go home which is absolutely brilliant because I love being able to do lots more follow-up and actually see them back to normality and I guess a lot of the issues that we um, are dealing with in these videos um, are because of medical interventions or because things have gone wrong um, so yeah I love eating and drinking and uh, <laughs> I, I specialize in it a lot and uh, talk about it every day <laughs> I know, I think we could talk about this all day. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so before we get into the next round of questions that we've got, I just wanted to kind of go back. In the previous video, we talked about ways to relieve pressure on eating during this time. And then we kept mentioning the fact that whenever children get, you know, stuck on certain, you know, parents say, oh, well, they ate well until six months, they ate well until a year, they ate well until eight months or four months, 
you know, whenever we see children that kind of get stuck in certain phases of their eating skill development, um, we need to go back and help them jump out of that phase to the next phase of their development. Um, and the SOS approach has um, something they talk about as hard munchables, with, which often children need to use um, to help them move their development on. Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit more about when it would be appropriate to use hard munchables or how we kind of develop oral motor skills in children? Um, give us some top tips on that if you can. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really um, brilliant area to cover. In terms of uh, what's important to remember is that your child, although they may be 8, 10, 12, one year old um, it's where they are on the developmental continuum and actually what level their their oral motor skills are at and what level they're able to cope with so just because a child is nine months old doesn't mean they can eat the nine month jars that you see in the supermarkets for instance um, so moving from the bottle onto weaning is obviously a huge big step around about five to six months of age then you would have a, you know you traditionally you would move up um, now there's baby led weaning with different types of foods and in a way baby led weaning has brought in uh, maybe less um, strictly as SOS does um, but they introduce you know, crunchier textures, harder textures. And so puree is the easiest thing, having kind of very runny puree, transitioning from um, milk in the bottle to foods. And that's more of a traditional thing, but you then move up onto thicker textures, thicker puree, mash, um, and likewise. So if you have a child who is just used to putting food into the front of their tongue, um, on a spoon and swallowing it back and I think in the previous video we were talking a, a lot about a child who doesn't actually chew just swallows um, then really one of the techniques would be to introduce hard munchables and those are foods that you can't or shouldn't be able to actually bite something off and swallow it so it, it's much less risky now thinking about it in terms of not food that you can use a spoon as a hard munchable because it's not food but and it's it's impossible to actually chew through somebody will tell me of course an eight-year-old can chew through a spoon <laughs> um, and they can it is it is physically possible for older children with big teeth but on the whole if you're putting the spoon to the front of the mouth there is no reason that you can't put it in towards the, the side of the mouth for instance and also the child could chew on the spoon or can place the spoon in a different position it doesn't always have to go to the front of the tongue the other thing is sometimes just holding the spoon on the tongue at the front and actually allowing the child to take the food off the spoon um, can really help them with the placement as well so a spoon in its very basic form can be used even very early on to help the child with placement and with helping with the um, sensory experience of food but a hard munchable in SOS terms is for instance um, a bicky peg um, a celery stick that isn't crunchy that's you know been um, that's a bit old so it's a bit hard you can't just bite it and break it off um, some uh, dried bananas those kind of things and you would actually I like that they always say stick shaped things stick shaped yeah. things and, <laughs> and when you think about a stick you know maybe it's the stick that your dog has in the in the park but no it's a stick like the child's finger so you like your finger so a carrot for instance uncooked peeled and and washed but a carrot stick like so that the child can actually hold it and put a bit in their mouth so that again it's about control and about encouraging the child to control it obviously if the child doesn't have the skills required hand to mouth skills then um, you can control it as well but you could just dip that into the puree and suddenly you've got something that gives a different texture a different sensory experience is that your understanding of the hard munchables 
Yeah, and I think it's always helpful that um, I remember thinking when either SOS um, explained this in in the training that we did, or else I just thought of it at the same time. But you know, when someone when you're at the dentist and they put something in your mouth and then you're automatically like push your tongue over and they say move your tongue and you're like okay move my tongue um so you know when we're having them explore things in the back of their mouth it may be a space that they're not used to exploring they're not used to being able to use their tongue to move things back to the right place in their mouth that we need to be able to chew with our back teeth um, and a lot of children don't and if you're only eating purees and only eating kind of bite and dissolve pringles and snacks and stuff they're not having to use those back areas of the mouth and so it's about just bringing awareness um, and just trying to kind of wake up the back part of your mouth and again just kind of strengthening your tongue that you're like okay well if I put something in the back of my mouth and my tongue automatically goes over there then it's just giving the tongue a little prompt about something to push against um, so from a sensory perspective I guess it just is helps develop awareness of having different things in their mouth and from a textural perspective it has brings awareness to feeling different textures of things in their mouth and yes you can use um, foods that your child wouldn't be able to bite and, and choke on so it needs to be really supervised um, but if you're if you're worried at all about safety you can also use yeah like a long kind of anything that's a stick you know a toothbrush or a spoon or um, they have kind of these like vibrating like chewy sticks that help bring awareness to the back of your mouth but um, yeah just really trying to get um, get things in your mouth and a lot of times I know we see children that didn't put things in their mouth as babies um I don't know if you see that quite often Sarah yes absolutely and I think I think it is getting better now um because I think we understand a little bit more about the need for children to get messy and mm. for messy play and but we definitely went through a phase where it was keeping everything clean and making sure that nothing went in the child's mouth because it would be unclean and um so nowadays we do see a lot of children um putting toys in their mouth and mouthing is such a huge big step um to be encouraged when children are developing their understanding of their mouth and how it feels and you know it's much safer in a way to chew on toys than it is to be chewing on foods and breaking things off and then having something to swallow the other thing to bear in mind um, is that when a child is mouthing something is mouthing a toy or even food increases secretions and saliva so if you've got a child that is struggling with swallowing even having extra secretions in their mouth might be uncomfortable for them so it's about balancing and how many children we see or how many parents we see and the parents tell us oh but he'll he'll put everything in his mouth except food and how clever children become very quickly at working out the difference between a toy and will happily sit and munch on a toy but wouldn't put anything that um, even is going to give them a flavor or a taste into their mouth so yeah um, and also I think a lot of toys they'll chew just with their front teeth and a lot of those teething rings and thing you know like I had to work quite hard because I was of course <laughs> put my child in feeding therapy from birth um, <laughs> not because he needed it just because he was going to have it um, and I know Sophie the giraffe you know Sophie the giraffe yeah and she has like long feet and legs and stuff Yes. which is great because it gets their back teeth but a lot of the other stuff in the teething rings we were giving stuff you know they're just really working right at the front of their mouth and so we do need to just try to develop that awareness of the back of children's mouths and certainly if your child didn't chew on things as a baby um we need to go back and um kind of help them go through that stage and help them learn that it is okay to put things in their mouth and they do need to to put things in their mouth safely um and in a supervised setting um, in order to develop that awareness of what's going on um, inside their mouth. Absolutely. And when the um, when they're born, the gag reflex is there. And as they as you get older, the gag reflex moves further and further back. So they actually need to inhibit the gag reflex. So as a parent, you watch a child put something, you know, a toy into the mouth and then they suddenly go Bleh and you panic because you're thinking, oh what have they, you know, what have they swallowed? What are they choking on? Um, and so it can be very uncomfortable for you to actually watch your child do that. But you're absolutely right. The only way 
to help them is by putting extra things in even your finger put your finger into the child's mouth and baby's <laughs> mouth. And he, yeah. I would never put my finger in my child's mouth he'd bite it off <laughs> well now that he's got teeth he has very point, sharp teeth I'm talking about <laughs> I'm talking about babies that um, you know it's it's absolutely fine yeah. and I think I think the thing is that pa parents think of teething rings as when they have teeth then we'll give them a teething ring actually the pain and discomfort is there before the teeth erupt it's when it's actually with the the pain is with the teeth coming through the bone so encouraging biting encouraging um moving the gag reflex back even before the teeth are there absolutely my goodness don't put yeah, your yeah. teeth no no, no. I'm, just, I'm, thinking about, I'm thinking the about i'm thinking about a 10 year old <laughs> Like all these ten year olds, no, don't put your hands in the children. No, do not put your hands. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. That is hilarious. Um okay, so anything else about oral motor? Basically it's just good for your children to chew on a variety of different things. Um we can talk a little bit more about other things to support oral motor um in a later video, I think, because I'm um also aware we're just like the time is running away with us again and we did the second video so we could answer these questions. So um uh, am I okay to find the questions? Do you have anything else you want to say before we do that? Not at all. Not okay. at all. That. Um, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so, yes. So here are some of the questions that were sent in. Did I say everything that we needed to say before this? I think so. Um, this is a three-year-old who's never touched food, eating 10-month purees, um, doesn't know how to chew, is not able to drink independently. After two months, gave up milk. Now mum uses a syringe to give him fluids. Eek. Um, what, um, I mean, as immediately for me, from a sensory perspective, if a child's never touched food, we need to work on um, him in whatever way possible, reducing those stress responses, showing them how to play with their food. It's very, very important if your child doesn't play with their food, then they don't, if they don't get the food, the information about, the food in their hands and then you know kind of really exploring it with their hands they need to have that feeling of the food in their hands and that gives them information about what's going to happen when the food goes in their mouth how heavy it's going to be whether it's going to be hard or soft whether it's going to be liquid whether it's going to be hot or cold so it is very important for children to be able to touch their food um, and certainly little ones like this um, so yeah so from a sensory perspective i would definitely recommend um this person have some um some like some sort of sensory intervention um, and possibly have some full feeding therapy if, if we're if we're this far um, if we're this far kind of down the line of not of not touching food at three um, so I think basically kind of urgent support would be needed but tell me talk, talk to me about Sarah what um, what to do about the fact that they're only drinking out of a syringe and gave up milk at two months what does that does that say for you um I think it says to me that they are doing their absolute best and I think all praise to that mom for using a syringe um, because that is not an easy way to go and obviously it's not ideal she knows it's not ideal um, but she's getting the fluid in which is is great I think definitely seeking some help and support in looking at other ways of getting the fluid in um, i'm sure that she's tried 101 different things sometimes and i i think this is where you and i work so well together because sensory um you know what is it about the syringe um and i guess in some ways i'm you know that very passive in terms of him accepting the syringe and it being put there and then he all he has to do is swallow he doesn't have to touch anything um but is there another way is there you know what about a straw um that the straw I is think then that she said he wouldn't drink out of a straw i don't have those notes in front of me i just wrote a thing no. but i think she said no. he won't drink independently at all she's tried different cups and straws and stuff i, I mean i i think you just take it right back to basics and just start again you don't want to lose the syringe because obviously it's important um syringe has to be done very very slowly very gradually when you think about how much we take in when we're swallowing um, and it's a very slow process so it's not ideal at all 
um, but I think definitely getting support from your local team. Um, and what would that be, the swallow team? So um, hopefully you've got a feeding clinic in your area, um, which so needs definitely go to the paediatrician, um, maybe under a paediatrician, then ask to go to the feeding clinic, which would be speech and language therapist and a dietitian, possibly OT as well. Um, and just have a real overview of what it is possible to do. Um, I think too, this, I, just, I didn't realise, I just didn't say, he has an a, they have an AS, ASD diagnosis. And I think sometimes the autistic kids in certain areas and certain services, you know, I've definitely been in meetings where social workers have said, oh, well, it's fine they don't eat very much because they have autism. And I think, well, no, it's not fine that they don't eat very much because they have autism. You know, we know we see a very high prevalence of, of feeding difficulties in children with autism, but that doesn't give services any excuse to not give the right support to children. So certainly if you if you're not getting if you're going to your GP, you need to ask for more specialist support. Um, and you know, if you're not able to get that, then unfortunately, I don't know what else to recommend, but besides go to the charities that we'll talk about in a minute or um, get some private support, we can we can certainly try and help you. Um, but yeah, I think to me, this this all sounds like quite, yeah, yeah, worrying and distressful for, for the mum and the baby. And yeah, it just seems like you definitely need to get some extra support. And like Sarah said, well, well done to the mum for, for being this patient and trying this hard. It must be really, really difficult. Anything else? And I, th I think I think it's making every drop count as well, you know, that um, dietitians are able to help with high calorie fluids, high calorie um, milks. I know you've said he doesn't take milk, but there are lots and lots of options out there, um, much more than I know. And so I think it's really important to make sure that you do get the help and support that you need. Um, from somebody who is sympathetic and um, yeah sometimes a lot of a lot of these children's problems are masked because parents are doing such a great job because they are persisting in spending so much time um, feeding so the weight gain looks good and you know unfortunately we go according to the red book and according to the weight charts and the growth charts and everything and if your child appears to be growing at a satisfactory rate how you're getting that done um, doesn't necessarily come into it and even if it's causing so much stress and anxiety at home um, so that's really why going to a feeding clinic where they really understand and um, we are so used to seeing feeding problems that we when you say that actually you're sp spending all day every day just getting some fluid into this child then we know that there are so many other more enjoyable things for your child that there are um, that we need to, to give you help and support and there is a lot of help and support out there if you get to the right people yeah yeah that's very good advice Sarah thank you and yeah well done to this mum for for coping with that but yeah please do ask for some specialist support um so we have another um child here that um I didn't know if you'd be able to signpost as well Sarah um so a 12 year old unfortunately barely eating at all um, has lost lots of weight. So um, again, I wasn't sure about the red flags for losing weight, and whether you knew anything about that. Um, I mean, of course, if a child is barely eating, the strategies we mentioned in the previous video about trying to make things as relaxed as possible, always offering the preferred foods, always making sure that the child feels in control and you don't lose those preferred foods, and certainly trying to get some help as soon as possible um, from a feeding team to try and build in new foods, because it does take a long time to build in new foods. Um, so yeah, certainly just trying to get some help as soon as you can. Um, regarding the losing lots of weight, Sarah, from a kind of, do, do you have any advice about, about that? I, th I think there's a, there's a couple of issues here for me. Um, so I know, um, you know, I tend to think about the younger children, but when it's been a very long term problem and it's been since birth or since one year old and they're now 10 then that is one kind of problem and we can definitely help and intervene and and but if there is something new it, you know your child best if something has recently developed 
that they have it is causing them to lose weight there is a sudden weight loss then absolutely go for medical help straight away um and probably at this stage i think we were going to say it at the end but um you know please do not hesitate i know with covid we're very worried about going to the hospitals very worried about going to gps everything is still there and um you know just this weekend i've seen articles about people um you know saying the nhs is still open and um please please call your gp get some help and advice um losing weight is not normal obviously if the child is stopped eating they're going to lose weight it is about you know calories in um affects how much weight and whatever i think 10 percent of your body weight is a huge amount to lose that is quite a significant amount um sometimes people would probably even say five percent so if you're noticing a trend obviously if the child is unwell the first thing that goes is is eating and drinking you don't feel like you want to and if they've been unwell, the last thing that comes back is eating and drinking. So it can be a sign that they're unwell. And if, so they've got a chest infection, they've got an ear infection, whatever. Um, if they're unwell, they will lose weight because they don't eat as much. That's absolutely, you know, we know that for every normal child. But if there is a sudden loss of weight, a a prolonged period of time where they don't eat and actually they're not unwell that they do have um you know they don't have a temperature that everything else is looking fine then it is really really imperative to to contact your gp and get onward referral um, unfortunately it can take a while to get to the right people so the sooner you ask for help the better um, and and the quicker you will get some help and support yeah, that's really, that's really um, good advice. Thank you, Sarah. So I guess what the advice I was talking about with looking for a feeding team to expand the diet, that would be more if your child has had a restricted as, diet since yes. they were one, um, but they're kind of slowly losing food, slowly losing foods and losing weight. Yes. That would be yes. more to yes. look for the feeding team. But yeah, if it's anything sudden, absolutely, then that's and also, kind of emergency medical, well, emergency, you know, like very urgent medical looking at underlying something else it could be Under, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and um it, it may be that you come to the feeding team once they've decided what the mm. problem is um but yeah it's it, it just and you know there's there's nasty reasons for sudden loss but um i had i had a child who um a 13 year old girl um and she had swallowed a fish bone and it got stuck and um it took a, you know took them a while to to remove it and after that she just felt that she couldn't swallow and she became completely aware of her swallow she became paranoid about everything that she um you know was going to swallow eating became such a huge big emotional problem as you can imagine after that traumatic event yeah, yeah. for her um, and we actually needed to work with her to help her realize that actually she did have a safe swallow that everything was working absolutely fine that it had, had just been a one-off and we actually used um uh, chewing gum as a solution because we yeah, got her to, to you know <laughs> my reverse psychology approach was don't swallow the chewing gum and suddenly somebody telling you not to swallow what do you want to do you want to swallow something yeah. don't you? <laughs> um so yeah so so we used that obviously she was very cognitively aware she was able to discuss it all with us and explain all her you know worries and fears um and we did get her swallowing again um but yeah sudden sudden stopping the other thing to reassure parents because again very often i i hear parents say to me oh the child my child doesn't swallow just doesn't swallow is has your child is your child dribbling because we actually produce a child would produce about 500 mils of saliva a day so if it, if they don't have loads of drool down the front of their um tops then they are swallowing 500 mils of fluid a day so please don't worry as much about swallowing um if they're not dribbling 
Yeah, that's very good advice. Fun fact there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> we are really unusual, aren't we? I'm like, that is so interesting. <laughs> I need a hobby. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> okay moving on to our next question um so yeah so this is a kind of quite a different question i wonder if we should stay with swallow what do you think stay with swallow or go to something different stay to swallow stay with swallow okay i don't know what you've got waiting for me to stay with swallow. <laughs> um okay so this one actually i remember i inquired about the ages on this um family because i wasn't quite sure but so there's a family with two children um a little boy or a boy of some age that has ASD and sensory issues. Um, he's only on a puree diet, um, but happy with new tastes. So brilliant and well done that he's able to tolerate different flavors. Um, he wants to eat normal food really badly, bless him. Um, but also it's a very positive sign that he has that motivation. Um, he is able to eat quavers so parents thought that that meant he didn't have a swallow difficulty um and so i wanted to ask you about your opinion on that um and then maybe i'll do that before we go to the the daughter um so what's your opinion on able to swallow quavers but only eating purees do you think that what does that say about swallow to you um well i th i think fantastic exactly what you say about the puree um they're doing really well and great that they're having quavers. Um, quavers we regard as um, a bite, what we call a bite and dissolve texture. And so they don't actually need any chewing. So I think possibly what this chap needs is how we're going to move him from the purees to the to swallowing harder textures and harder textures like we've already explained is going to need uh, more advanced oral motor skills so that's what you're going to need to work on um, that would be my my advice um, so that I mean fantastic that he's motivated and again if you're heading towards six seven years of age um, it's very very hard beyond that to but for a period of time and then when they come out of of that so kind of 10 11 and then they can actually start talking hopefully about um how they feel and things so being motivated is one of the main plus points here um and i think yeah with a good program they'd be able to to move them on yeah so yeah really making sure he gets a good yeah, oral motor program in place from Good a therapist. Oral motor program, yeah. yeah, and and um and just take it slow, slow yeah. and steady wins the race. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, so with the daughter, bless bless her, this woman has two children with feeding difficulties. Um, she has a limited diet, um, which um, the mum also said she feels it's related to food allergies. Because um, the child has lots of food allergies and had um, a upset tummy really fr frequently as a baby, um, so I guess for me, if if there was any kind of sensory um, issues, that you know there may be some other reasons for the limited diet, um, and also even if a child did have food allergies or does have food allergies, that you know that kind of discomfort can can stay in a child's brain and in their memory um, to where it makes eating unpleasant. Um, and certainly any kind of bad memories we have about an activity doesn't make us want to do them again. Um, and we know from brain scans that children that have felt pain from eating before, they can look at a certain food and feel that pain again. You know, the pain receptors in their brain are firing still. Um, so just, I guess the message from my perspective would be maybe just still they might this child might need some kind of feeding therapy or feeding support um or some sensory support to kind of just un, really unpick why she has this limited diet because we see lots and lots and lots of children that have stomach issues and food allergies um which kind of prompts and is underlying um a feeding difficulty so like sarah said before even if even if the food allergies are now settled it could be just still um the you know the feeding difficulty is still maintaining and we want to to go in and sort and yeah make sure that's not left untreated but do you have anything else to add on on food allergies and upset tummies 
No, but can I just add a real, um, a, a real life example of my son who um, is now 23 years I'm old. I'm sure he'll love this. <laughs> yeah. I won't let him watch it. It's fine. Um, when I'm he sure he doesn't three, want to watch it. <laughs> when he was three, he, I took him to a birthday party. He ate all the sweets, all the rubbish that was at the birthday party. And then he ate a cherry tomato. That evening he vomited. And since then he swears to everybody, even to this day, that he is allergic to cherry tomatoes. <laughs> so that is one vomit on one cherry tomato. So that is how strong the um laying down of those neural pathways is that even with reasoning and everything else that i have done believe me i've tried i've tried feeding yeah. therapy with my son um i have not got him so to much for your results huh <laughs> you can treat a thousand babies successfully and you can't treat your own son it's just like every mother huh it's like it's impossible he won't do what i says exactly i know how hard this is yeah. um, but no, it, you know, that actually I can tell you things, you know, I remember, everybody remembers times that they've been sick and it's, again, it's about survival. So for these children that have had very difficult starts through having food allergies, um, it's just awful for them. And it's a miracle that any parent gets them to feed really because, um, so they're doing a great job. but. Um, definitely need help and support to move on. Yeah, great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, okay, so we have another one. Yeah, this is one that I actually thought maybe was queried a dietitian referral. Um, but a child, I don't have the age actually, very restricted diet, um, lots of binge eating at night, even after meals where mum feels he couldn't be hungry, um, and lots of cravings of chocolate and sugar. So I didn't know if maybe, yeah, just his diet was kind of all out of whack and needed a dietitian review, um, whether the demands of the meals again are too high that like we talked about, maybe the, the food is too difficult to eat at meals. So he'd kind of rather binge and get his calories on chocolate and sugar, um, whether his appetite's been kind of all zapped and messed up by sugar to where he just is having different cravings. I don't know. I felt like to me, I just... I just didn't know what to say about that one, but <laughs> besides what I just said, um, do you have any other insight on res very restricted diet, but craving chocolate and sugar, binge eating at night after meals? I, I, th I definitely would, would second going and seeing a dietitian um, because she will be able to unpick exactly how much he's getting and, um, you know, have some strategies for that i think um if he's of an age a game where you can just find out what he is feeling then go for that because um and you know again reward charts or some kind of um you know discussion about it but i think healthy food unfortunately is the foods that require the most um the most sensory experience the most effort to eat mm. so for us foods that we re so if we serve up some you know chicken and broccoli and roast potato actually that's an awful lot of chewing an awful lot of coordination of different textures different experiences um, and different tastes and flavors and um so it could be that actually he really can't cope with that um and so he's going for the things that melt in the mouth and that are easy to chew um yeah because maybe he's kind of eating a little bit through his meals obviously we don't know how much he's eating at meals but you know, maybe he's kind of eating a little bit to one of those children that likes to kind of satisfy their parents and just do what's on the routine <laughs> i don't have yeah. one of those um but then you know he's kind of spending the whole meal feeling really hungry and um and then you know just like any of us i know if i get too hungry then i just like really overeat so maybe he's kind of experiencing that where um there's something about nighttime where he's able to to binge and that helps him go to sleep or something because he's feeling hungry all day or something yes um, yes i think there's also there's you know head hunger and real hunger 
So, you know, I know that sometimes about nine o'clock at night, you know, I can be thinking, oh, actually, I really fancy something. Um, I don't I don't eat. I don't need it. But there's something about it being nine o'clock at night, you know, that I quite fancy a hot chocolate or, um, you know, that that's the time I'll be <laughs> looking for a biscuit in the kitchen. Um, so, yeah, there is something about you know at night time and not wanting to go to bed hungry and um I, I think lots lots of room for discussion yeah lots of room yeah, for, like, for trial and error to to see um yeah just a bit more information to to unpick but yeah i think certainly if we both agree on maybe asking for a dietitian review as well to check to yeah. check what's going on with this guy um, yeah great thanks um so here i have I think maybe one for me, but you can you can talk too if you want. Um, oh, so have <laughs> your permission. <laughs> I didn't want you to feel pressure to talk because I feel like it's just one for me. But um, <laughs> you just talk to you. you lost your voice. <laughs> um, so here I have a we're entering delirium now. Here I have a fifteen-year-old um, child with a diagnosis of dyspraxia, and mum feels likely an ASD diagnosis as well. Um, he's a fussy eater with limited diet um, and poor guy, lots of anxiety eating in front of others since he was nine or 10. I don't know if something happened around then or not, but um, mm. he will eat in public. He will eat finger foods like burger and pizza, um, but he won't use cutlery in public. He won't eat anything at school, even though mum sends lunch. Um, and he usually doesn't like to eat with his family. So, um, for me, I automatically think a child with dyspraxia will have trouble coordinating their body. And so coordinating cutlery is, is really a demanding um, task anyway. Um, and so, yeah, if you knew you were kind of awkward and not very good at something and you knew you kind of got messy when you use cutlery, that um, you'd certainly, especially as a 15-year-old boy, not, not want to do that in public. Um, and, you know, maybe someone kind of poked fun at him a bit when he was 10 and he just remembers that and so yes um, yes and certainly already if he if he has kind of a limited diet and is a fussy eater and he already you know finds eating not not a very nice experience then anything that puts a barrier into eating I feel like parents all the time ask me about cutlery um, and I think we'll, I always say well, would you ask a you know a, tw a 14 month old baby to use cutlery well no because you'd realize they're still learning about foods and you know it's important for them to to learn about foods first and then you kind of do things with manners and cutlery um but certainly a lot of children i see even older than this guy um are not able to coordinate using cutlery and i always just say you know whenever possible if it works in your family routines like remove any barriers to using um to food so anything that makes eating harder just take it away for now until they develop all those all those eating skills and they don't have as, as much of a limited diet that's, you know, at least it's not concerning you. Um, and um, yeah. I Again. think, I think <laughs> to <laughs> add, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think also to add to that, um, the hearing, um, I know that a lot of children actually can't bear the sound of some, either foods in their mouth so this what they hear mm. from the chewing is really off-putting but also eating with the family um then you know you hear somebody else's clicking jaw or you hear them scraping their plate or you hear well, you have to them smell and look at all those other foods as well yeah, yeah absolutely and again you know a bit like we were talking about taking the pressure off you know actually um if he's saying i don't want to eat with the family well it why is it such a high pressure situation is it what other people are doing or is it that people are sitting at the table and only focusing on on him or is everybody eating all at the same time and um if it if it gets to the stage then you know saying well actually once a week you can sit and eat a dinner with us the rest of the day you know the rest of the time you have it quietly by yourself um i know some families who one of the children will wear um headphones 
while he's at the table because they want him at the table and they want to see that he's eating um, but he literally cannot bear the sounds that other people are making so you know again lots of intervention lots of strategies there to think about well what is it um, and does the child at school need to be in the in the hall um, is there a quiet room yeah, that he can I mean, actually I measure lunch? sound in school um, lunch halls all the time and it they're like higher than building sites I mean it's it's they're danger above the recommended um, noise levels for you know for adults yes. without ear protection like eating in a school lunch hall is incredibly 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 um, stressful and certainly if this child um, has any or this teenager has any kind of underlying sensory issues which is likely if he has an AS, if, if he is suspected ASD then um, then yeah we certainly want to look at how we can work to improve those those underlying sensory um, needs in order to help him with sounds or um, obviously to help with development of his fine motor skills for cutlery but um, certainly also I was thinking this is a good one for uh, um, one of our future videos is going to be about kind of trying to really reinforce positive mealtime routine so there might be some yeah. good advice in that video for this family because obviously we don't know what your mealtime routine is but if we give you some top tips about um, the best ways to form a really positive mealtime routine maybe you can work towards that with him but um, yeah it's, it's just a real shame it's just, yeah it's a shame to see those really anxious teenagers it's, yeah mm. um, Teenage being a teenager is hard enough without yes. being an yeah. yeah. Well, I think you're anxious anyway, but yeah. yeah, yeah. I think yeah, I would just say remove the pressure for now. You know, just let him eat the finger foods. Let him, you know, some people order burger and pizza every time they go out anyway because that's their favorite food and they don't have it at home. So, I would just say try to reduce the pressure until you can work out the kind of underlying issues that are going on, um, and then getting him some help. So, in the longer term, you're not. You know not presenting any challenges with them but trying to figure out um how you can make it as easy as possible in the short term just so you don't develop yeah. any new new problems basically yeah absolutely um, cool okay we're going to the next one um so yeah actually i think there was a few of these that i just like didn't have enough information on um yeah, so here's one that is a 14-year-old, another teenager, 14-year-old ASD child with sensory issues, underweight, um, very limited diet. Um, a year ago was put on um, milkshakes on prescription. Um, and yeah, again, just obviously not enough information for us to advise. We don't know what's in their diet, but certainly if, if they're able to tolerate milkshakes and that's kind of a preferred thing, you always look at what will they tolerate and is there underlying sensory issues are there underlying oral motor delays um just like really making sure that even though if they've gotten this far to be 14 um obviously there is a problem if they are losing weight like sarah said about the child we talked about a few minutes ago if it's something recent or if it's something that's been going on a long time the limited diet i think that just yeah some some more things to kind of unpick but um yeah just kind of wanted and, to and go back to the dietitian I mean, it's great that they're already on milkshakes. Um, don't feel that the dietitian can only give milkshakes. And sometimes you might need to go up. So you might have been prescribed one milkshake. Now they might need two. Um, you know, the most important thing is to not be losing weight. Um, <clears throat> because when you're losing weight, it's a sign that you're not actually taking in enough calories. That means you haven't got enough energy. Your body's not able to, particularly as a teenager, to grow. Um, and so um, go go back to the dietitian and ask just because you've had a one appointment doesn't mean yeah, that that's, that was a year ago now actually so yeah maybe yeah. they need a review yeah absolutely yeah. review from the dietitian that's good advice um so yeah so another one um oh poor guy this um boy is 10 again we don't have the foods that he will eat but um incredibly fearful of foods becomes super distressed very limited diet oh no sorry he's not 10 he only has 10 foods okay that's a worry um that's a worry but brilliant because yeah. we had somebody before who only had five yeah so. no, it's better than five um still it's definitely a red flag if you're a child only has 10 definitely foods. red flag 
and you definitely yep. need to get some support sooner rather than later from um, a feeding therapy team or a feeding therapist because you don't want those foods to reduce any further and it does take time um, he is becomes super distressed even if people come near him so mum said sometimes we'll even vomit if his sister comes near him with an apple um, yeah just very fearful mum was queer, querying an ARFID diagnosis um, I mean again if you if you find it helpful to get a diagnosis then maybe you get some some good support but um certainly if a child's this distressed and they can't even be you know around food at all like you know non-preferred foods at all i think certainly you just need to get him started on some feeding therapy um and then maybe with some psychology support as well to make sure that you can kind of address those underlying fears um and work towards expanding his diet and reducing that anxiety so um, yeah. Yes, and I th I think um, it's it's about avoiding those situations. So um, making sure that there is very clear rules for you know the siblings having food around um, the child. You know that he doesn't suddenly come across somebody with food. You know there should be no surprises. It should be very clear um, clues, and it should be you know you know little uh little jimmy's sister is going to have an apple but she's going to have it in the kitchen you know it shouldn't be that she can just walk around the house with an apple that he's suddenly going to see somebody yeah feeding that would be my my advice because think about how stressful it is yeah, for you him. don't want to kind of be on alert all the time but obviously that would be in the short term in the long term we want children to be around foods and long term we want to expose them to a wide range of foods but when you're in your home you don't want to kind of be in this state of fight or flight all the time thinking someone's going to come near with you with foods and so yeah um yeah i think that's that's yeah very um yeah kind of thoughtful and important strategy in the short term but we don't want to get into also reinforcing with the child long term like he's afraid of foods you know we don't want to keep reinforcing those those ideas but yeah certainly i think in the short term that that's actually really good a piece of advice that I wouldn't have thought to say. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so we've got three more questions here. Um, so we've got one, um, she's an 11 year old girl. Her brother has um, an ASD diagnosis. She, I think, tried to get one and didn't, but often with girls, we, we see they don't quite meet the diagnostic criteria because, um, do you know, recently I heard that the ADOS, you know, that they use to mm -hmm. diagnose, diagnose autism, yeah. It was um, it was designed basically just for boys, so that's why a lot of the girls are falling through the net. No. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, wow. I heard it on a webinar the other day. I was like, I need to look into that some more. Um, so yeah. So anyway, query ASD diagnosis for this child. Obviously, I'm not diagnosing her from afar, um, but she's had food issues since four months. She's eleven. Lots of mm. food issues with food and textures. Um, Again, we don't have what she does eat, but um, but again, from my perspective, I would go back and look at if she's been having food issues since four months, then does that mean she's only on purees? Um, we don't know that, but. No, I would, think, I would think that she's just had a lot of difficulty. So whatever she does eat now is, is through lots of hard work. Yeah. Um, and it's, yeah. What a long time to have yeah. eating issues. Um, and certainly just to encourage her mother as well, just to get some support with the sensory issues because, I mean, textures are the most complex piece of the sensory puzzle. Um, and so, you know, looking at food is easier than tolerating different textures. Um, but still, we want to under address those underlying sensory issues. So certainly trying to get a sensory assessment or some sensory information or some sensory therapy, um, and then also um, potentially some feeding support. But we don't quite have enough information on that one. Um, yeah. No. OK, so um, this one kind of, I think, stumped us both. We weren't quite sure where to go on this one, but we'll talk a little bit about her anyway. 11-year-old girl, um, mum reports she doesn't eat much. She always, in brackets, needs the toilet at mealtimes. Um, she says, poor girl, she says she feels sick every time she eats. Um, and the other day she said she needed the toilet, mum said she 
kind of ran out and before she even got to the toilet, she was retching and then vomited on the floor in the toilet. Um, so I didn't know whether there was some kind of underlying stomach like GI issue. Um, we didn't know whether there was some kind of body image issues going on. Um, yeah, I just, I wasn't quite sure where to go with this one. It seems a little bit atypical to me, but I didn't know whether you had any. I think, well, and I, and I think, is this something new or is this a development of, you know, that she's never really enjoyed food. And so this is just the fear and, you know, she's, this is an avoidance strategy. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, when you first say the question, said the question, it was like, she doesn't like sitting at meal times, and then, you know, then she says she needs the toilet. Well, saying that you need the toilet is always an avoidance strategy mm. because it gets you out immediately. Yeah. The one thing that you can yeah, yeah. leave anything for yeah. if you <laughs> the toilet. Um, so I would, you know, I see that as an avoidance strategy. She's very yeah. successfully using, but I think the vomiting is now something that's an add on and clearly shows um huge distress again making sure that she hasn't you know she's she hasn't actually got a tummy bug or um you know that this is just a transient thing then i would definitely be going to the gp um and and exploring it further um to get some help if it was you know a development um then the, G the gp should be able to help um yeah yeah, and certainly if she hasn't eaten much her whole life, you know, maybe there is some kind of underlying difficulty where she, if she doesn't find eating easy and pleasurable and an activity that she wants to do, then there is normally some kind of underlying reason why that's happening. So, you know. And if she says she feels sick after she eats, then it would be very, very interesting to be getting a food diary as to how much she eats what causes it? Is there any patterns? Yeah, That's where you start yeah. off looking. Um, you know, is it when she eats bread? Is it when she eats harder foods? Is it when she eats meat? What is there that yeah. actually she feels sick? So, what with? would that be? A dietitian would take that food diary. Is that a swallow like feeding, um, like a service like you work with? Um, do you know? I I would even recommend just doing a food diary and taking it to the G GP. So okay. when you, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, at the moment, you're probably going to get a telephone consultation with the GP, but you can email things in. So yeah. having ready to be able to say to him because, um, or her, um, but having <laughs> but I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, having, having information to give to your doctor is always good because the first thing that they need to know is first of all what's the problem but actually what have you done to you know to try and help this so you know is she having good days bad days is she having good meals bad meals um is it that if everything is pureed and she just had everything pureed she wouldn't feel sick because again that just um it can go much slower through the stomach and doesn't um cause as many issues but if it's something that she's had to chew and then she does feel sick that's indicating that a, you know, a certain problem within the stomach um she might have you know, i mean i don't even want to to go into what she might have because there's 101 different things but um at least it it starts narrowing it down to is there an actual physical reason and i think sometimes we're very keen to to say oh well it's in their head you know they're a fussy feeder or um you know it's it's up until recently um you know we've said they're behavioral feeders and it's all been about behavior as if they can actually do something or you can do something as a parent um but it's it's you know we need to actually look at her swallow look at what she's eating look at the time of day that she's eating and and look for an actual physical reason like you say you know is there a gi reason is there a an actual problem with her stomach with const i mean constipation is a huge big issue because if you if you're not getting rid of stuff it backs up in your system and then you do feel uncomfortable you feel sick you can feel very very dis you know a lot of discomfort from constipation which you don't necessarily think of as eat when you're eating mm. you don't necessarily think of that as being a problem so there's there's loads and loads of different issues to look at um but she's telling you she feels sick 
start off with that and start, you know, listen to her and believe her and trust her and then work on that, work yeah. from that. Yeah, I think you brought up a lot of really good points there, actually. And um, I think some of that advice could just apply to all parents. I think that kind of detective work as a parent and really gathering data, really like writing down a list of exactly what your child is eating. Um, you know, a lot of times parents will say, oh, my child doesn't eat anything except this. And then I'll say, well, you know, we really unpick it. And then actually, you know, maybe they have 15 foods where 15 foods is like not enough. But, you know, 15 is better than two. And I think if you just go to the GP sometimes and say, oh, my child doesn't eat anything, they just think, oh, I'm sure they eat something. And then if you end up saying, oh, they eat this and this and this. But, you know, if you go to the GP and say, I'm incredibly concerned about my child, she will only eat 15 foods, you know, and here's a list of them. You know, it's much harder to kind of brush you off if they don't, you know, I think sometimes I remember I used to take my baby and they'd be like, first time mum, you know, <laughs> you know, just like, and you know, there was nothing wrong with him. I just was sure he had a terrible disease. Or something. Um, you know, but you know, I think they do need to kind of screen out these overreactive mothers from mothers that are not overreacting. Like I'm sure all the children that we've talked about tonight, the mothers are definitely not overreacting. And so, um, yeah, I think just as much kind of data and facts that you can have um, ready when you go talk to doctors and ask for referrals. Um, and actually a good, um, that leads on to Feeding Matters, the charity. Um, I'd encourage everyone to go and look at their website and register for their newsletters. They have a questionnaire that you can go through um, and answer about your child eating that covers all areas of their life, not just their diet, but everything. Um, it's very holistic. And then you can print it out at the end and you can take it to your GP and say, because it will say, depending on what you answered, that is a red flag for a feeding difficulty. That is a red flag. That is a red flag. So you'll have a list that's printed that you can take to them or email to them and say, I have 10 red flags. Like this child definitely has a problem. And um, sometimes that's a bit easier than trying to kind of remember everything when you're in your 10 minute GP appointment. So, um, so yeah, so thanks for bringing up those points there and certainly encourage parents to look at Feeding Matters um, website for that. Um, we have one more question um, and then we'll be finished for the evening. And this one is, sounds very, very complex um, and sounds like he's under lots of questions anyway. So I kind of hesitate even talking about him, but maybe I'll be able to offer something helpful, Sarah. Um, so this is a 13 month old little boy that has a kidney disorder. I think we talked about him briefly before. He's had multiple surgeries um, on purees only and eating by syringe, is sick approximately once a day. He has some um, cologne, I think it's called, at each feed to help him with his weight. I guess he's under some dietitian. Um, I know yeah. mom said he was waiting for a um, speech and language um, referral and maybe OT, but hadn't seen them yet. Um, and then some stuff about sensory that I can talk about afterwards, but I feel like that's quite a lot of information already. Um, do you have anything that you can just as far as like general advice, reassure this mum or, or signpost her too. So um, I think, first of all, amazing that you've got him onto purees, um, really good. And um, with the syringe, I think in this situation, it's probably needed. Obviously, it's not how we would recommend, but um, I think that is important. With some renal conditions, um, vomiting is actually a sign of dehydration. Um, so I would really encourage you to go and speak to your renal dietitian uh, for help and support and making sure that um, he is able to have enough fluids. Um, some, some renal conditions are very fluid restricted and others they need to have quite a lot. So um, it's always a very fine balance and um, when I worked with the renal team, it definitely was the dietitian was the key person um, who was able to to guide on that. Um, I think at 13 months, please just have fun with food, um, introduce foods in a pleasant way. But until you get the vomiting sorted out, um, then again, it, it's we don't want to introduce too many new foods because of what we've already talked about but maybe they so, could do just like kind of food fun and you know stacking oh. carrot sticks up and knocking them over and you know it could be just kind of um food exposure rather than um foods for for eating 
eat yes yes absolutely and i think i think that's a very good point that actually they you know everything that you're going to do the play around food should be not with the expectation of actually swallowing food food down mm. um and sometimes not not all the time but sometimes children actually miss out stages um so what i mean by that is very often those you know seven month jars which have the lumps in and you know the the kind of next stage on from the purees um sometimes children will actually won't do that and then they'll just start eating more the family foods so don't panic at all at 13 months um it's good that you've you know that you are worried about it because obviously we can help you um and you are already referred locally to to the speech therapist and the occupational therapist but um i think yeah it's it's best to just relax um be guided by your renal team with that yeah. and certainly they've got the family has gone through four surgeries in basically a year so that's a huge you know amount of trauma to recover from so yeah well done for for kind of reaching out and, and asking for some support and um and yeah i think certainly even if you know even if your child doesn't want to play with foods even if you can kind of you know if you're eating something you can put a little bit in front of him if he doesn't want to play with it you can prompt him to feed you which children love to do especially at that age um, or you can just show him what you're eating take a few bites show him what's inside your mouth you know you can do lots of play even if the child doesn't want to kind of interact with the food just try to have lots of food around them and have lots of really positive experience with food um, I think this mum actually did send me a lovely picture of a sensory corner she made for her child and which was just like looks like she's just oh, like wonderful. yeah just really going all out so um well done to her for that very yeah, aware very that's a lovely um lovely looking corner um she did say that he was very um hesitant to touch food or um wouldn't touch any um any sand or any kind of thing so she was trying to do kind of a messy play corner for him and um i'd just say if he i think you said he didn't really want to go over to the sensory corner but um sensory um, exposure and sensory developing our senses is you know it's a long and slow approach as well so if he doesn't want to touch any foods or he doesn't want to touch any sand and you're trying to have this lovely sensory corner for him it could be that that's just too much for him to have all of that sensory exposure at once it could be that when he's really happy and playing with something else you kind of bring in you know a few carrot sticks with his lego or one-year-old's probably not playing with lego yet but you know if you could Duplo. Bring... Duplo, yeah <laughs> um <laughs> i was just thinking when did benjamin start playing with it um but you know you could think about ways to just involve food in a very non-threatening way um into times where he's playing in very small amounts um and certainly you know if he doesn't want to touch sand or anything it might even be that you just try to get him to spend more time being barefoot outdoors if he can um, or even in socks first and just try to get as much kind of touch input during play and try to get him to kind of roll around on different textures of of towels or blankets or rugs or you know anything you can do with kind of rough and tumble play um, with him if he's able just really trying to take it back a few steps if they're not able to tolerate touching things and looking at things um, touching things with another tool so will they kind of stir different things or will they run a car through some different food or different um, textures yeah just really taking it back a few steps to what they're comfortable doing it will they watch you play with sand um will they you know pick up some sand and pour it if the container so not actually touching it themselves I'm just really trying to make things as playful as possible and reducing the demand so you're starting where the child is so you're not just saying of course you want to touch food why don't you touch food then you think what can we go back a step can he watch me touch food or you know touch something with a tool or something so um yeah really well done for doing the sensory corner and recognizing um the sensory needs are there but yeah definitely want to probably just scale it back a little bit and make sure it's a just just right challenge for him so um, and and where we start out louisa you know looking at actually you know our first step towards eating is 
tolerating in the same room. Mm. So, you know, there are lots of children out there who can't tolerate food yeah. in this or certain foods in the same room. And maybe that sensory corner is, is kind of, he can't tolerate it at the moment, but bringing it a little bit in a container mm. towards him um you know that that is is maybe better than um encouraging him to go into an area there where he's just totally surrounded yeah. by things that he finds scary um and i think it's also knowing what will happen i think it's it's similar to the earlier question about you know the sibling with the apple um you know you don't want to feel, oh, it's it's going to happen all the time or being anxious in your environment. So um, it's great that it is in one area and one corner, but it's about also trying to bring it, it closer to where the child is at. Yeah. Or, yeah, offering other textures that are easier for them. You know, if they can't manage sand, maybe they can manage, yeah, like I said, a rough towel or um, yes. yeah, maybe that sand is just will happen in a few months and right now they're ready is, for a scratchy jumper. <laughs> Is water easier than sound? Um, than sand? Depends. Some children have a lot of difficulty with water, um, and some okay. children are fine with water. So, um, but yeah, I think. I mean, I would think water is easier than sand, but that's for me. So, <laughs> you know, sand is like you can kind of form it and hold it in certain ways, where water is really unpredictable and yes, you know, yes, kind of drips yes. in places and then runs and. Um, so for some children, they would find water harder to tolerate on their skin than sand. But, um, but yeah, but um, those are our questions for tonight um, or for our second video. And yeah, just we'll just review some signposting um, again quickly. Um, we would always signpost people to go look at the SOS approach because that's who've done our feeding therapy. And we just think that they're a brilliant organization with amazing results and some lovely resources for parents as well. Um, feeding matters again the charity we mentioned earlier is great um, Sarah will put a link to her contact details in the comments of the video you can contact me through um, the sensory children Facebook page um, and I'll put my email address in the in the comments as well um, just seeing if there's anyone else yeah certainly if you want to um, to commission us to do some private feeding therapy or a feeding assessment we're available and we can do that remotely um, and I would definitely urge, encourage anyone that thinks their child has sensory difficulties to either get a sensory assessment. You can request through your GP. There's some services that are commissioning um, sensory assessments now, excuse me. <coughs> um, or you can do that privately, but there's lots of sensory information online. It's much more readily available than the feeding information. So um, yeah, get some support with the sensory stuff as well. Um, is there anything you want to say about referrals or signposting that we haven't mentioned? No, I, I just encourage you to contact health professionals um, as you would have before COVID. Um, obviously, some services are not running, but um, at least you're getting onto a waiting list um, and the referral will still be made. So yeah please so feel the big feeding teams and things yeah to, yeah but but also don't be afraid you know at the end of the day if your child is choking on food please take your child to a and e okay do not hesitate do not hesitate to contact an ambulance if your child is choking you know there are still the nhs is still there for everybody and is still prepared to see children that we are still concerned about so high risk children like having chest infections because of their swallowing complications, um, we do have, still have services for them across the country. Thank you very much. And I didn't actually mention in this video that, yes, yeah, Sarah works during the week for the NHS, so she is doing this video for free for us um, on her weekend. So, yeah, it's very, very kind of you. And, um, yeah, thanks to all the other NHS workers out there as well for us. Um, so yes so thanks everyone for listening um and we'll look forward to seeing you we'll be doing future videos about sporting positive mealtime routines and introducing new foods and answering to the best as we can um any additional questions that people would like to post on the sensory children um facebook page um yeah
have a lovely evening. Thanks, Sarah. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.